Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. I'm Jeff DeBloy, Assistant Curator and Publications Manager, and it's really my pleasure uh, to welcome you here to an artist voice conversation between Dr. Leslie King Hammond and Napoleon Jones Henderson on the occasion of Napoleon's exhibition, I Am As I Am, A Man. I hope everyone here has had a chance to see the exhibition, but if you haven't, there will be time after the talk to head up to the galleries. We'll be open till nine tonight. We're so fortunate tonight to have two old friends here in person, in conversation, and I wanna thank Dr. King Hammond and Napoleon for being with us. I'm so looking forward to it, and it's a privilege to introduce you, so thank you. Leslie King Hammond is an art historian, curator, artist, and cultural and community innovator. She is Professor Emerita, former graduate dean and founding director of the Center of Race and Culture at the Maryland Institute College of Art. King Hammond sits on the board of the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of Maryland African American History and Culture, Collections and Acquisitions Committee of the Walters Art Museum and the Baltimore Arts Realty Corporation. She's had an active career teaching, consulting, lecturing, curating exhibitions, writing essays and publications on numerous artists and cultural movements that include Jacob Lawrence, um, Huey Lee Smith, Betty Saar, and Romare Bearden, among others. <clears throat> King Hammond's artistry has been exhibited widely, including close by at Montserrat College of Art Gallery. Her mixed media bricolage installations and fiber works explore the anonymity of women's handwork in the intersection of African diasporic spiritual beliefs. For more than 50 years, Napoleon Jones Henderson has created works that strive to highlight, celebrate, and empower the communities where he lives. Jones Henderson is a long-standing member of the influential artist collective African Commune of Bad Relevant Artists, or AfriCobra, a group who came together in Chicago in 1968. Jones Henderson's works translate AfriCobra's aesthetic principles to create images inspired by the lived experience and cultures of people of the African diaspora in an accessible graphic style with shining Kool-Aid colors. <clears throat> And he's made this translation into a variety of media, most notably his magisterial tapestries, but also in mosaic tile works, shrine-like sculptures, and works of paper, the full range of which is on view in the exhibition upstairs. Based in Roxbury, where since 1974 he has been an influential community member, educator, and mentor, Jones Henderson's work is often oriented around themes of pan-Africanism and racial justice. His kaleidoscopic works aim to be self-affirming and reflective with an eye toward both a fraught past and a liberated future. Born in 1943 in Chicago, Jones Henderson attended the Sorbonne, Paris, holds a BFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and an MFA from Maryland Institute College of Art. As a long-standing member of AfriCobra, he was included in the collective's first exhibition, 10 in Search of a Nation, at the Studio Museum in Harlem in 1970, and later in exhibitions presented at the Museum of the National Center of Afro-American Artists in Roxbury and the University Art Gallery at UMass Amherst. More recently, his work was included in AfriCobra, Messages to the People, at Museum of Contemporary Art North Miami in 2018, a portion of which traveled to Venice, Italy as AfriCobra Nation Time, an official collateral event of the 2019 Venice Biennale. Jones Henderson has been awarded several pub public art commissions, including at the Bruce C. Bowling Municipal Building in Roxbury and Roxbury Community College. He's executive director of the Research Institute of African and African Diaspora Arts in Roxbury. And quite amazingly, on the night of his exhibition opening here, Napoleon was awarded a certificate of recognition from Mayor Wu's newly formed Office for Black Male Advancement, recognizing his contribution in Roxbury since 1974 as an influential community member, educator, and mentor, and for his lifetime achievement of over 50 years of creativity and dedication in arts and culture. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Leslie King Hammond and Napoleon Jones Henderson. Thank you so much. This is just an honor and a privilege and once again, very humbling to be in the company of Napoleon Jones Henderson. He and I have known each other for a very long time. Oh, spell. 
<laughs> a spell or two. And it has been amazing to watch him as an artist, as a community innovator, as a creative in this country, fighting, working, and committed to his craft, which is so brilliantly installed in this museum. I'm trying to remember the very first time I met you. And I can't recall if it was Chicago or New York or if it was Shelby State Community College when we did the African American Craft Perhaps. Congress. It might have been uh, Shelby. It might have been Shelby, It yes. might have been where we actually really spoke, but we've been on the periphery at all those other locations as well. Exactly, because at that time during the 70s, we were all very hungry to be involved with each other and to understand what each other were doing. I was a newly minted doctoral candidate out of Johns Hopkins University, and having survived that experience, I was then hired, listen, when you're on a plantation, you know, and I'm reading Octavia Butler's Kindred, all right, I too thought I was going through a portal, you know. <laughs> so here I am hired to teach at Maryland Institute College of Art because the black students there were demanding presence. And so what I had to do in order to create a course curriculum and to gather images is that I had to go to all these conferences and these art studios and begin to form relationships and friendships that have grown over decades with individuals like Napoleon Jones Henderson. So with that, I now get the chance to really probe into his life in a way that he probably doesn't want me to do and I really have to be very tactful about it. But <clears throat> the thing that fascinated me about Napoleon at that time in the beginning of the 70s is that Napoleon was the only man that I knew was interested in fibers, in weaving, in textiles. And I thought that that was simply astonishing because at the time, during the 70s and in the 80s, there was a strong urge towards color, there was a strong urge towards texture, there was a strong urge towards identity. But Napoleon, you chose fiber. Why? Uh, I have to comb my hair every day, and so started <laughs> with that. And I think <clears throat> it's, it's uh, I would say, High school, I, I, I've always been around mm -hmm. my grandmothers and my aunts and uh, other women in my family, my mother and sisters. And textiles has always been an interesting uh, element of life activity mm -hmm. in making quilts or patching your pants when you mm -hmm. wore out. Now people spend big money to buy torn up clothes, but mm -hmm. back in those days, when right. it, uh, it was a necessity. And so uh, Big Mama, my mother's side, mother, uh, always crocheted and knitted, and she made these afghans and covers for beds, and we had quilts from everywhere, and family being from Mississippi and Alabama, you know, they grew cotton as well on, the, on my mm -hmm. people's land there, and so it was just one of those things as well as I will say that my high school teacher, uh, Helen Joyner, who was a recently graduated student from uh, University of Arkansas, mm -hmm. Pine Bluff, uh, mm -hmm. Arkansas, came to Chicago, and she through the doors open, and here I am today, still dealing with it. All right, well, let's set that first image up. Yes. See, baby, baby, no, I'm Napoleon. <laughs> here at the loom. And so tell us what you're doing here. Well, this is when I first came to Boston in 1974. I came here uh, to teach at Mass College where I teach weaving. I was going to be here for just a year. And as much as I love seafood, and I knew this was the old industry for textiles, and I was sure that there were mills here in which I would be able to find materials that I could not find otherwise. And lo and behold, I actually did, which I think is the very reason I'm still here, because I found these materials. Mm -hmm. But that loom there is one of the looms that I was weaving on in my studio in Chicago when a group of students from Mass College of Art visited my studio while they were in Chicago at the National Conference of Black Artists com Conference that year. That was 1974 and asked if I would uh, like to come to Boston to teach for a year. And I said, 
make sure they send me a ticket and I'll be there. <laughs> and uh, and plus, I was close to New York and I didn't have to live there so I can get to D.C. Mm-hmm. and Philly. Mm-hmm. So uh, it was it was good. So mm-hmm. that's in my studio, and it was taken by one of my one of the students at Mass College of Art, uh, Omo Bowale Ayurinde, mm-hmm. who is a lifelong friend, and that's uh, iconic for me. Uh, photograph that really speaks to the spirit and the eye of someone who really understands what a camera is all about and how it needs to be used. Mm-hmm. Now tell me, what kind of, tell, I would tell the audience, what kind of loom is this? Well, this is an upright loom, a traditional uh, type of loom that's used in uh, most of the tapestries you'll see in the Museum of Fine Arts Boston and all the other great museums where they were done in the 14th, 15th, and earlier 18th, 19th century. Uh, that particular type of loom is one that you're able to uh, see the image that is just before you. Usually there's a cartoon, a paper drawing that's uh, hanging behind mm-hmm. the warp, which is, would be to the left-hand side of mm-hmm. where I'm uh, looking at the image. And you pull the warp, the heddles at the top there, and you pass your weft back and forth. And so ostensibly what you have before me is a canvas, and the weft yarns are my... Um, if you will, my uh, brushes, my paints, my Conte crayons, mm-hmm. my pastels, and I actually create the visual image that happens. But I don't have a warp uh, cartoon behind this. What I do is I use uh, felt tip pen pencils mm-hmm. and I actually draw on the warp because it's under uh, such tension. It's almost you could just actually it's like a tra- a, a, a trampoline mm-hmm. if you were to lay it out horizontal to the ground. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's one of my loom. I built that loom. I built all I built all of my equipment. That was one of the things I learned from Little Reno, who was the uh, woodshop director at the Art Institute in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you He's, still have it? Oh, I still have it. I have it, and I have uh, a total of about 12 looms at home that I work on. Wow. I move from one to the other. Oh, come on, show us what uh, oh. you made from these looms. And the images before you, all of the images, the ones on the walls mm-hmm. and the ones on the bases st- sitting out front, are uh, the works culminating my uh, BFA uh, tenure at the Art Institute in Chicago, and this was the uh, fellowship exhibition. At the end of the uh, four-year uh, tenure there, they usually mount from a selected body of students a fellowship uh, competition. And that year I was graduating. I was one of the uh, students in that exhibition, and these works here are usually on the left-hand side up on the wall. That's a woven tapestry. And it's a constructed piece that you see just to the other right-hand side of that. And three-dimensional forms are actually are roughly about eight feet high and about uh, 36 inches in mm-hmm. diameter at the base. And they were inspired, and more often they were in, informed by uh, the hairstyles of the young Maasai men when they're, before they reached their manhood, which at that time, the profusion of braided uh, hair that they have is shaved from their head to enter to him, to allow them to enter into manhood. They leave their childhood behind, the hair is a representative of that. And the ochre color is reminiscent of the clay and the oil-based mm-hmm. body decoration mm-hmm. that you see mm-hmm. most prevalent in that area. Yeah, well, those colors are very much reminiscent and very much not even reminiscent, but reflective right. of the palette and the colors that were symbolically and spiritually important oh, to those cultures. So next. And these, you got something you want to ask about these? You can, I don't have to ask anything. We can read, and you are supposed to tell us okay. exactly. Come on now. All right. Uh uh uh. Okay. Well, give it up. Give it up. Okay. Well, on, it's my, my, my left. So is this your left as well, the TCB? Yeah. Okay. All mm-hmm. right. I want to make sure we got the same mm-hmm. side. That is a piece that's roughly, uh, well, you saw it in the gallery. I think it's 48 inches or so wide by about 60 inches in the other direction. And it actually is the first representation of what I mentioned in terms of the upright loom is that the warp is principally a canvas and the weft yarns are my uh, color instruments, my mark makers. And this particular tapestry is uh, inspired by and informed by Barbara Jones who was one of the, uh, she's deceased now, why I say was, a uh, member of Afri Cobra, um, the 10 of us. And this particular silk screen print, she was an extraordinarily gifted person in terms of handling the surface of uh, 
design and the anatomy in terms of presenting it in such a way that it addressed absolutely the frontality, which is one of the uh, philosophical aspects of Africobra, and the whole aspect of the uh, profusion of the surface of a work, whether it's a tapestry, whether it was a garment, or whether it was a print mm -hmm. or a painting, that no area in that composition was left untreated. And of course, the mask form, very prevalent, but TCB, who knows what TCB means? Yeah. Come on, speak up. Taking care of business, and that's what Africobra mm -hmm. was about. That's why you have on the left-hand mm -hmm. side and the right-hand side those particular uh, directives, so to speak. And the one on the other side to the right is a similar size in terms of dimensions. And that one is uh, a homage in a way of speaking, but it also is a, um, a challenge to uh, the young men Living in Chicago at the time, there were a couple of gangs on the south side where we lived, and it was the Peace Stone Nation, the Black Stone Nation, and the Black Stone Rangers, and the Disciples. And so the term Stop Genocide was really about what we see happening prolifically across this country today, is young men killing each other for no kinds of reasons whatsoever. Mm -hmm. There's no reason at all, but that the kind of stuff that goes on. And these, these two pieces were pieces of the early aspects of Afrocobras use of frontality, color, and, and words. Words were very much important in the work because it was about speaking to the people. The images are reflective of the people of the community that we are in. And so uh, these two pieces were pieces that allowed me to actually uh, launch myself into doing in textile weaving what I wanted to do, uh, which is approach it as a painterly medium mm -hmm. and to create what I call visual music. Okay, so question. When you did these two pieces, did you do a cartoon, an illustration, or a sketch? Uh, the central piece on the right-hand side, Stop Genocide, mm -hmm. that particular piece, that area is principally drawn from Barbara Jones's print. Okay. The one on the right is the entirety, of, on the left is mm -hmm. the entirety of the print. Mm -hmm. And I did do a thumbnail sketch, mm -hmm. but I really never ever make full-scale cartoons. Okay because the manner of creating these works is very organic right. and it's a musical composition. And so to that extent, whatever notes I may score in terms of writing out a score, when I begin to play it, it has to change Got it. because the colors have all those kinds of energies and rhythms. And so I, I know where I want to go. Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, if, well, as I say, it's, it might be, uh, it's a long journey, but it was a short trip mm -hmm. and I get there. And so I, have little thumbnail sketches, but I don't really do them all. Do you do keep the thumbnails? Do you keep them? Oh, I have everything okay. I've done. All right. Um, what I'd like to interject at this point so that you understand the importance of this work is that Barbara Jones Hope was a brilliant graphic designer. And she was in part, and we'll talk about in a minute, the Afro-Cobra movement and the impact that she had. The graphics that are displayed here, and this is why I asked you mm -hmm. if they're sketches, right. are a catalyst or inspired by Barbara Jones Hope. Right. And right now, also, with this um, flourishing movement of interest now in the narratives and the stories and the presence of black visual artists, there's a scholar right now, um, Cheryl uh, Miller Holmes, who is doing a study on all of the black graphic designers right. who were laid invisible in this history. So this would include people like Emery Douglas right. from the Black Panthers, yep. right. do you understand? Barbara Joan Hobbs, mm -hmm. all right? Your works, do you understand? Right. In terms of how you would replay these mm -hmm. dynamics, these patterns, these, these images, which also created a language which became very important in how during the black arts movement of the 70s and the 80s began to make an impressive impact on the visuality of American art at that time. Yeah, because these works were really about uh, allowing people to see themselves in the works that they saw depicted by the visual artists in that community. Right. And so these very much are the, the Blackstone Rangers and the mm -hmm. Disciples. Definitely, they were elevated to a place that they took consideration of the issue of mm -hmm. stopping the genocide. Right. 
So not only were we creating visual images, we were having an in dialogue with the activity <laughs> taking place in the community yes. on the political and social and cultural level yes. simultaneously. And these two pieces here, I think the one on the left speaks for itself, uh, and the one on the right is about fertility, but both of these are pieces that were, uh, it's, they, they represent something that I've just most recently began to revisit, which I'm now just actually coming to recognize this, in the sense of the use of the aspect of dance or rhythm and movement in the African traditional art form. Because the first pieces, the Maasai pieces, and all those pieces, those relationships of how the African world creates and uses the visual form in all manner, and in textiles in particular, it is worn in a manner that we know in the religious and uh, uh, theological format as garments for the practice of one's mm -hmm. spiritual life. Mm -hmm. And the raffia is an element that is indigenous to uh, the continent and many other places as well, but it's used in the context of creating uh, a communication, if you will, between the spirits of those who have gone on and those individuals who are still present in our environment. And so these were, uh, in a way speaking, they were masked to be danced, right. but they were also uh, the one in particular, the uh, uh, America Kaka, is about looking at the American flag in the context in which Barbara Jones so eloquently introduced to the world, mm -hmm. is that the five-pointed star, if extracted or extrapolated in a particular kind of way, uh, really looks very much like one of our most noted institutions in this country, the Ku Klux Klan. Mm -hmm. And so utilizing that element, the skull factor, the colors of the American flag, and the aspect of dance and or mask as a way of masquerading, uh, it was to activate that whole aspect of what the American flag represents. And of course, the left-hand side piece is clearly one of those that deals with the Bakuba uh, Raffia doll figure up at the top and the uh, female mother figure at the bottom where the child is on the head of the mother, which is the guardian of the child and taking her forward into adulthood. Yeah, but you also have this deaf confrontary because now you're dealing with on the loom and off the loom because right. the raffia, you understand, is right. loose, free, Absolutely. and also connotes movement. And it was also a, 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 an aspect of what was occurring across the world in contemporary craft mm -hmm. medium because Claire Zeisler, who lived in Chicago, uh, was someone I knew there in Chicago who was very much a part of utilizing uh, fibers of that, tarp, of that type, such as raffia and jute rope and things of that nature mm -hmm. in creating the kind of work. So I was mm -hmm. in the dialogue of the international use of materials, right. but they came from another kind of base, the base of that authenticity of my uh, ancestral heritage being brought forward in the works mm -hmm. that were about what Africa's mm -hmm. philosophy is about is uh, creating works that speak mm -hmm. to the community itself mm -hmm. straight ahead. So now you're moving into to, uh, expanding the media and going into two-dimensional surface. These are two-dimensional surfaces, but they are three-dimensional forms. Mm -hmm. Because the one on the left that says unite now with the Janus head figure of, in the, in the mm -hmm. center is, uh, again, these are two pieces that Barbara Jones and I collaborated on. Barbara and I collaborated on a, collaborated on a lot of work. Mm -hmm. We uh, spent a lot of time, we shared a studio for a number of years before I left Chicago to come here. And uh, I used to do a lot of work with leather. I got started with leather in, at the Art Institute. I was looking for a portfolio uh, to carry my drawing pads and sketchbooks back and forth to school. And they didn't have any uh, the size I needed. And plus, I didn't have the money to pay for the ones they did have. So I made mine. <laughs> And I still have it today, so it's been around since 1968. It's, a, it's in good shape. Mm -hmm. But these two pieces here, we decided that the art not only, because Jay Jarrell, who was one of the other Africa right. members, she was a fashion designer. She made right. garments and clothing. And uh, we decided to make uh, wearable, as they call it now, wearable art. And so the aspect of the print that we worked on on the left piece, Unite Now, the other one on the other side is Unite with a, an extrapolation of the lower portion mm -hmm. of the continent of Africa and Unite written in another kind of uh, mm -hmm. very polyrhythmic kind of uh, musical mm -hmm. visual uh, context. And that's a dashiki on the right of which I used to wear it, believe it or not, in the summer. And 
That was back then. <laughs> you couldn't grease me and get me in it now, but nonetheless, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's in the gallery upstairs, but they are the works. We, we wore our art. Uh, and Jay Jarrell was the most extraordinary person to translate the two-dimensional aspect of Afrocobra's work into three-dimensional mm -hmm. form. Come on. And that's the group. Oh my God. That's the Motley crew. This, um, this was a moment in history when they burst onto the scene. Okay? Be yeah. that between Afro Cobra and the Black Panthers. It's Black Panthers, hey. That's right. And uh, well, I've had a young man did tell me one day, he said they consider us the Black Panthers of the visual artists. Really? Right, right. So I don't, have, I don't have an argument with that. We were True. very symbolic. The, uh, that's the group. There's little Jay, little Gerald, who is now, he has his own children. Uh, and that's Jay Wadsworth. There's Nelson Stevens. I'm going from uh, little Jay coming across. And that's Barbara Jones with her arms crossed. And then her very, you know, I'm in your face mode. <laughs> Gerald Williams right behind him. And so she was not to be to uh, uh, toyed with. Sherman Beck and myself just next to Sherman Beck. Mm -hmm. Carolyn Lawrence. Omar Lama and Big Jeff, Jeff Donaldson. He's tall. He's standing on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, as Michael Harris says, uh, Jeff was taller than most, and he really was. He went. He left Chicago, went on to uh, take on the chairmanship of the art department at Howard University, and ultimately, when he passed away in 2004, he was the dean of the College of Art. Nelson spent 35 or better years teaching at UMass Amherst in uh, the western part of the state. Carolyn and, and, and Wadsworth, her old man there standing on the far left, they uh, came to Boston for about a week and they said they couldn't take it. They got right back on the train and went to D.C. <laughs> so coming from Chicago, coming here, and I think all of you know, uh, and if you don't, just go back and look up the history of Boston in 1974. You'll understand. And knowing Wadsworth, he did the best thing to go to D.C. because there'd have been a lot of trouble up here if he'd <laughs> stayed. Because he's from, as he says, Albany, Georgia. <laughs> and so, uh, Omar Lama, Carolyn Lawrence, uh, who ended up being the head of the um, Southside School Public School Department Art Program in the city of Chicago, and me. You know my story. I've been here for these number of years. Yeah, but they're responsible for what was called Kool-Aid Colors. Oh, absolutely. Kool-Aid Colors. That's what we called it back in the day. And they made uh, such a statement within communities because what you also have to understand is that this is the group that also talked about making art affordable for the community. Yep. So they made wonderful prints, stellar quality. And now these prints that were sold at the time at the Monosphere... Ten dollars. Ten dollars. Yes. We printed the price on the print, so if it was sold by somebody else on the other side of the country, they couldn't jug the people because our art was for the people. That's right. And so uh, you'd have to cut off part of the print if you wanted to take the price out. But they were ten dollars. But now they're going ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars. Nelson Stevens, them. one of his prints just of late, is somewhere between ten and twelve five. Right. A print. All right. So these things are just. Absolutely beginning to blow up. Finally, and, while these artists are still alive to receive their flowers. And the, part, the other part about it, which is really important, they were 30, they are, 30 by 40 inches. Mm -hmm. We were in not only intending for people to have positive images of themselves in their homes, but they were going to be big enough that everybody was impacted by it. Mm -hmm. You didn't miss it when you came in, you didn't mm -hmm. miss it when you went out. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but we did learn in the first year that uh, we might want to make them a little smaller <laughs> because we would have as many as 12 to 15 screens and that's a screen for each color, 30 by 40. And that's when we were all much younger, much lighter and much more energetic and we thought we could you know, uh, change the world, which we did, but we understood you could do it in smaller increments as well. <laughs> and this is, uh, this is the launching pad. This is the front and back. It was a double-sided poster. Uh, the, at the time of the 1970, the director of the Studio Museum in Harlem, which was located on 125th and 5th Avenue, not its current present location, but uh, 
Ed Sprague met us in Chicago at the Confaba conference that Jeff Donaldson organized when he was a doctoral student at North Eastern, Northwestern University, um, and invited us to come to New York City to do an exhibition. His words, if they are not exactly as I'm going to speak them, is a very close paraphrase. They need to see this in New York City. And so he invited us, we came to New York, and we uh, set about and tried to decide on how we were going to present ourselves. And uh, Nation Time, we all know Amiri Baraka, we know Nation Time. And that was how we understood that the title of our exhibition had to be about the community and about the issues of the African world at the time. And that was also the time when many African and non-European colonized countries were unyoking themselves from the colonial masters, quote, mm -hmm. to use their colonial language. And so uh, we decided that uh, we were in search of a nation. And we were forming a nation or a national nation mentality among the black, Latino, Asian community in this country. And so nothing could be more appropriate for the title of an exhibition of work that was establishing itself in grounding an identity, not only aesthetic, political, social, and cultural identity. And the Gala Day mask, which is still in the collection at Howard University, Jeff gave it to him, that was our mascot, the Gala Day mask. Mm -hmm. And while we were at a meeting, we decided we needed to have it become a little bit more African-American, so they took my sunglasses off and put them on there, and they're still there. So uh, the Gala Day became real hip on the uh, on the black side here. You know? Yeah, and the Africans picked it up too. I know they did. Yes. <laughs> and, oh, let me just go back to that. What we did, we put all our images and our little brief resumes on one side so people would know who we were, who we are, and we put a piece of work of each of ours on the back side ensconced inside the uh, outside borders of the continent mm -hmm. of, of Africa. Uh, this piece here uh, is a piece, as the dates can indicate there, it took me a while to get to finish it. It, it. it came about very much like one of my tapestries, although it's a two-dimensional work on paper because it was about finding the rhythm and the materials to bring it to its full, uh, as I would say, its full vibratory aspect of what I was trying to achieve. And that was in the context of trying to... Uh, bring forward visually that which uh, Senghor dealt with in his poetry, as he called it, the vibratory context of his poetry. And that whole aspect of creating, because that came out of my first visit to Senegal in 1985. And these were uh, three women at the airport. The one with the close orange haircut is a sister from Boston, Dita Galloway. Uh, who had come over to the conference as well, and that was the National Conference of Black Artists. Mm -hmm. It's an organization of African-American artists that was started in 1959 and continues to today uh, of African-American artists who at that time, for the most part, mostly taught at HBCU colleges and universities. And in the summer, or not so much summer, but around Easter holiday, they would have an annual conference. And by and large, which is how I got to Boston, the faculty at the colleges were uh, not so much mandated, but they thought it was their responsibility to bring right. a handful of students right. with them so that mm -hmm. they could meet those elder artists who were always already out here practicing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that was our first international conference. And I worked on trying to create in this piece the kind of vibratory imagery that I felt in Senegal and that uh, Senghor was working with in terms of his writing right. and his politics. Right. Now, I'm going to be the interjector because as he's giving this narrative, which is really critical, what I want you all to understand about this group of artists, these Afrocoba artists and the work that Napoleon was doing, is that they came out of a history where African-American artists had prior to the 70s had mm -hmm. very difficult time getting training in Beaux Arts institutions. Right. And so in the years and the decades, you know, from the Harlem Renaissance, 
you know, from the days of, of, of the um, uh, Jacob Lawrence uh, uh, artists and those artists that came out of that particular culture, they had workshops that were available during the WPA. But after that, there was a huge void. There was a huge right. void. So those artists who could get or get into workshops, even passing to get into different schools, would come back out and run workshops from their own studios, from their own homes, from their own sites. The thing about Afro Cobra that was so startling to the community as they emerged on the scene was the excellence of their craft. Each and every one of them were deaf masters and skilled in their area. The other thing that you all would do that I watched was that they would always meet and critique each other. Yeah. Always. Yeah. They did not, if they had kind of like a group meeting or an organizational meeting, it did not happen alone without the input of them saying to each other, what are you working on? Right. What are you looking at? How are you doing this? Yeah. This is how movements become historic and iconic with this emphasis. Right. And that was one thing that I owe, even though they were, you know, really, <clears throat> excuse me, very King Kong-ish, you know, the man thing was very powerful at the time. But your girl did, I got that, your girl did. However, uh -huh, yeah. the rest of y'all, yeah. okay? <laughs> um, but what I did admire them for was the way that they invested in each other's aesthetic development. Yeah, because see, we would meet by, when we were all still in Chicago, we would meet every Sunday or every other Sunday. We spend the whole day together. We bring work in progress and have these conversations about the work along with all the other political and social things happening internationally. And so that would infuse and body, find itself represented in the work. And we were about, uh, well, as we, we say, we're a family. And it was about investing in each other, right. you know, for the elevation of what we were about as a, a group of image makers. Now, these images here that you're showing us sort of jump fast forward because we missed past a very, very important impact in the lives of Afro Cobra and many African American artists who could participate in this. Talk to us a little bit about your encounter, your journey to Feste. <laughs> uh, well, we got to. We have a short amount of time. Yeah, I understand. But give us 25 yeah. words but, because they cannot not. Right. Because this work is directly is Absolutely. Related. No, Festec was to have occurred, I think it was in 1975, but through social and political situations on the continent of Africa, it did not occur until 1977. And what it is is a convening of Africans from all over the globe in Lagos, Nigeria in January, February of 1977. Uh, we were engaged and you had a colloquium of, you had intellects, you had scholars in all manner, you had artists, everybody came and brought work there. We mounted a, a huge exhibition of artists of, from all parts of the globe mm -hmm. who were African or African ancestry who came to that conference. We had musicians, Sun Ra, you know, Pharaoh Sanders, Stevie Wonder, Ray, Ray Franklin, right. you name them, Nina Smart, they were all there. And it was a living experience that allowed the, the spirits of our ancestors to reconvene in one place mm -hmm. at one time mm -hmm. from all over the planet from which we had been dispersed. Mm -hmm. And so the diaspora came back to Lagos, Senegal, uh, Lagos, Nigeria, for that particular period. And to, to, to give an example of how spiritual that thing was, now, I'm a weaver. Uh, I was very excited about being able to visit uh, the weavers up in the Ashogbo area of Nigeria. And luckily, uh, Agbo Falorin, a Nigerian sculptor who I knew from stateside, he lived in Oshogbo. So we found ourselves, Frank Smith, uh, myself, David, uh, uh, David Davies from Ohio, Winnie Owens, who's a ceramist from Howard University, um, um, 
Nance, Marilyn Nance, a photographer out of New York who was a, pretty much a, mm -hmm. uh, the official photographer for Festec. We all took a lorry, went up to Oshogbo, and we spent a good amount of time there. Winnie went off to a village and worked with the ceramic women out there in ceramics, and which turned her upside down and inside out. She hasn't been the same when she since, but she's creating the most fantastic work. And so I will say, I too had the same experience because when I got to Oshogbo, three or four little kids came running up to us. Frank Smith and I were walking, and Nelson, and he says. We've been expecting you. Okay. Now, I have not been to the continent ever. How are you expecting me? He said, you a weaver. And I said, well, yes, I am. They said, well, come with us. So they took me to this stall where this uh, mountain, mountains and mountains of fabric that they had woven was there and gave me, because I had two daughters, gave me uh, fabric for each of them to wear when they became grown. And so, I mean, you, that's the level of the entire Festec was the deepness of the spiritual connection between Africans from all over the planet coming to one place which was ancestrally the home base and to be welcomed and be told that we knew you were coming. <laughs> And so the new you were coming translates. He is, he is now at the point where, and this is just before you start to become formal and you and I meet at <laughs> MICA, yeah. Maryland Institute College of Art, because you are doing increasingly more work that has to do with the public arena. Yeah. Right? And you would be coming a presence here in this Boston area, as well as, I would say, this northeastern corridor, yeah. out to the Midwest, to Chicago. Napoleon Jones Henderson's reputation is expanding in a way that people are like, yeah, we know him. We know him. So tell us where you are now. Well, this is, uh, these pieces here came out of 2002, my time of hanging out in Baltimore with Leslie, known to you all as Dr. King Hammond, uh, at Maryland Institute College of Art. I, in 1987, uh, got a commission and was in competition and in community with one of my mentors, John Wilson, uh, one of the foundational pillars of American art, not to mention African American art, um, to do a piece for the Roxbury Community College. And um, I was troubled with how I was going to convince an art committee to accept two five foot by 10 foot tapestries as the decorative entry doors to a library. So mm -hmm. I'm asking them to hang, if you will, fabric in front mm -hmm. of the library mm -hmm. as doors. And my daughters came home from school and they had the little enamel, little earrings or cufflinks they had made at school. And so by that night, by the time they got to school the next morning and my presentation that evening at, to the committee, I had determined to do it in enamel on copper, which is ostensibly fused glass to metal. And it's a medium that has a history that goes all the way back to 5,000 years ago in ancient Egypt coming forward. And those works are still here. I began, I ran across an article in a paper of, of the quote, discovery of the blind boys of Alabama as if somehow they had been lost. But uh, I decided I was gonna do a series on gospel groups. And this is the first one. This is the blind boys of Alabama with, uh, as one of my little mentees have called them, my uh, uh, doodle noodles, the, the fan shaped forms you see at the bottom. And this piece finally got finished from 19, from not 19, well, 2002 to 2022, it took 20 years for it to fully get finished because the Hallelujah Sisters at the bottom, they just arrived when the <laughs> piece came down here. And that's the result of my, over those number of years, trying to find the gloves because it was not just having gloves. These are gloves that black women have worn at church and at funerals and services throughout. I collected them from uh, secondhand stores 
in South Carolina and Georgia and all up the eastern seaboard as I would drive back and forth when I was teaching at Benedict College in Columbia, South Carolina. So it took me all these years to find all these gloves. And so these sisters have joined in high praise, the Blind Boys of Alabama. And so I've, I work, as has been mentioned in several media, and the piece on the upper left-hand side is a silk screen print that uh, I began to have a little trouble with, and I decided I would take the, the prints and I would then move them to a mixed media profile of collage with gold leaf and color photo transfer and things of that nature. So the work is about uh, still having that kind of communication back and forth. And so these materials are materials that allow me to move into the public arena. And you'll see a few of those pieces at the end of this here. Um, and the lower right-hand side is the beginning, which the Blind Boys of Alabama comes out of, the series I've been working on for the last 22 years or so, uh, Requiem for Our Ancestors. And that also is informed by that journey I had to Oshogbo right. with the weavers there. So it, my, my entire career has been a journey that has had uh, markers along the way that continue to reappear because it's only one journey. And it's different stops along the journey. And so they, they get to go back and forth. And the uh, piece on the lower right-hand side is the installation that uh, uh, I started at MICA, which is uh, a cotton field, which you see just behind me, uh, and a video projection on the two walls in the rear and the structure that is similar to the structure on the left-hand side. And it had for roughly about 15 minutes a montage of various uh, photographic images that would cascade over the surface of that structure. And these structures are shrines to the spirits of the deceased who never received a proper honoring in their passing. And that starts with those who did not uh, finish that uh, transatlantic journey to those who died in those fields, those who have been and otherwise were lynched, and those who still today find themselves, their souls and spirits not being properly honored in their passing for all the various reasons of passing. So these structures have no windows, they have no doors. They are not places for the living, but they are places for the spirits of the deceased. And so that piece was uh, one, the beginning of that in my time down with Leslie at uh, Micah in 2002 to 2005, which was, uh, Oh, he worked my nerves. <laughs> well, it's a yeah. terrible thing when your friends come in and all of a sudden they decide they want to become your graduate students. Well, I mean, you look. It was, a, it was well worth it. I know it, but this is the one that's been after me for 30 years to come down there. I, look, and, while I was the graduate dean, let me interject again. <laughs> How many black graduate deans would you have? In the United States, I was an anomaly from 1976 until, you know, oh, 2016. I was just there. And I would tell every black artist that I knew, every Latino artist, every indigenous artist, every Asian artist, please come. I have scholarship money. I'm holding the door open. It only took him 20 odd years to get the message. I was busy. <laughs> Do, as my mama say, doing stuff. I had stuff to do. Uh, and that stuff is manifest in these two images here. The one on the lower right is a commission that was deinstalled. It was at the Black Falcon cruise ship terminal here in South Boston. Uh, those were fans that were uh, suspended in the ceiling, and those fans are informed by the patterns from the Bakuba Raffia textiles out of the Democratic Republic of Congo. And to the most recent 2020 uh, piece here, uh, Rhapsody of Knowledge, which is uh, those are my little collaborators there. These were the young children that lived in the Melrose community in Roanoke, Virginia, that I worked with with several workshops. I went back and forth down there uh, working with them, doing art workshops, having them do drawings on my doodle noodle shape. They were looking to do a drawing on a square or a rectangle. I said, no, you got a fan shape, work with that. And they came to the installation of this, uh, this here. There are three pieces. One is addressed to adults, one is addressed to children, and the other is addressed to teenagers. And so it speaks about the aspect of 
the importance of the wealth that exists in a library. And if you partake of what that wealth is in the library, you will become a much richer and fuller person and the world is fully your oyster, you know. It's beautiful. And lastly, on the, the, the cruise ship terminal piece is those pieces actually were able to move by the motion of the air circulating in the space. Mm -hmm. And they are about representing the sail of a ship that mm -hmm. if you use it, and it also is representative of the sextant, which is the instrument by which one navigates the celestial bodies and the surface of this planet. Mm -hmm. And so since ocean going ships do that, mm -hmm. they use that instrument and not only as the sextant, but also as the sail and the motion of the wind allowing right. that type of communication right. back and forth. Uh, right. That was all a part of the language of that mm -hmm. uh, commission. And this is uh, presently in the uh, Bruce C. Bowling Municipal Building in Nubian Square. And uh, it is a 29 foot by a nine and a half foot uh, enamel on carpa commission that was uh, the title of it. And you may notice from the previous piece, Rhapsody is an important word within the framework of a lot of these public art pieces because this piece represents the combined visual, spiritual, and cultural uh, musicality of the people of Roxbury and we know what a rhapsody is in terms of a musical score or a musical piece. And the life lived in the community is a vibratory aspect of a living rhapsody. And so this piece here uh, represents the people of Roxbury. It's just up the street from 12th Street Baptist, it's about two or three blocks from 12th Street mm -hmm. Baptist Church. And in that piece is a symbol uh, relating to not only Dr. King and uh, Coretta Scott King's time here at 12th Street Baptist mm -hmm. Church under Reverend Haynes, who has passed on, but his brother, who I met a long time before I got to Chicago, Roy Haynes, the drummer, who is 90, 94 years old now. He's still playing drums profusely. <laughs> and uh, the Maconda Project, I met him because he ran into my car mm -hmm. in Chicago <laughs> on, his way, on his way to a club to play a gig and told me that, oh, don't worry about it, just come on down and tell them, right, right, you know, you're my right, friend right, and I can get right, in. I went right. down and they said, who? No. <laughs> so at any rate, those are, those are the services. So I thought I'd give him a shout out in this piece. And so he's in there and the little snapshot you see on the other side are people from uh, the community that I saw at different times when I was up at, uh, at the former, at, before it was called Dudley right. Station at that time. Right. And my, I had two new daughters because my other two are grown and I got a granddaughter. Well, I have two new daughters I, that came to me as a result of this particular commission. They came to work with me as apprentices to do this work through a program at Mass College of Art. The, I don't know, I'm gonna mess it up. It's the Community Partners, somebody knew, CPCA. They are a piece, you got it, it's at Mass Art. But they sent me these two. They sent me these two young ladies, who virtually lived with me throughout 2015. And all of us who were here then, we know we had snow up to you know there, and um, we lived together, worked on this, uh, and they have continued to be with me. And I think Flo Linda is here tonight. She told me she was coming, and uh, it has this piece here is the most recent piece in terms of uh, Boston, that allows me to be able to give back, put out, not so much give back, but to put out into the community mm -hmm. the kind of gift that they've given to me the time I've been here in terms of the love and um, just you know being here and being a part of my uh, journey in Boston, which I will say uh, has had uh, some real interesting times. Yeah, and you're not done yet either. No, I'm not, I'm not mm, done. Mm -mm. We have time for some questions? I think we do. Questions, observations? Yes. Complaints? Hold on one second. <laughs> we want to get a mic over here. What happened to the mics? Mics? Oh, here yeah, we come. Here we go. Here, here we go. comes, right here. Well, we want your questions to be heard. Um, one of the pieces upstairs in the gallery, it mentions Duke Ellington was one of the inspirations. Right. And I'm just wondering if that was inspired by just a lifelong listening of jazz or 
a specific time period of Duke Ellington, Duke Ellington's music. All of what you just said, and I'll take it and expand on it a little bit more. Yeah, that that uh, Duke Ellington wrote a suite of music called Sacred Suite. And in it are a number of vignettes. I think there are 11 vignettes, different compositions. And they speak to different time markers in African's journey in the Western Hemisphere. And I have, uh, and the piece you're looking at just with the doodle noodle fork profile is uh, I've taken it upon myself to translate that suite of music, which I've been working on since about 87, into visual pieces. And which is why I say what I'm dealing with is making visual music. And so each one of those suites of in vignettes in that suite will ultimately end up being a particular work. And yes, jazz, black music across the board, because all of it's jazz, because Duke Ellington said, it's not, it's not jazz, it's African music. That music is in all of these works. And so those particular ones identified to Duke Ellington very specifically is about that suite of sacred music that he wrote. So you, as Leslie said, I still have yet work to do. You'll see those other vignettes begin to appear down the road. Mm -hmm. Somebody yes. else right here? going to pass you the mic. And so the, the mu music is in all of my work. It's just that some are specifically identified by a particular musician, so to speak, and there's Mysterioso, which is in here, which is a piece of uh, Thelonious Monk, and so. Greetings. Greetings. Long time no see. I only see part of it. So. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, I wanted to know a little bit more about your um, relationship, whether it was spiritual or whether you had actually known him and talked with him, of uh, James Baldwin. Because mm -hmm. yeah. I noticed you had right. him a couple of times on your, on your uh, spirit. Yeah, I was uh, blessed and it was a blessing to been able to uh, meet and know him in the manner of being able to have break bread together and have conversation with many others. Nelson Stevens, as I mentioned, my other Africa Open member, taught at UMass Amherst, Max Rose, James Baldwin, Chinua Achebe, you know, you name them. All of those people have come through that uh, Africana program at uh, UMass Amherst. And as I was working on this piece, it's a part of the uh, Requiem for Our Ancestors series, the shrines, for those souls that are need a place to reside, rest. I remembered that when I left this country in 1962 <laughs> to go to study in Europe, in, in Paris, the book I took with me was Baldwin's Another Country. So from 1962 to 2022, he and I have reconnected in that journey. As I say, it's all one journey. There are just different markers on that journey. And so, yes, I did know him and had occasion two or three times to be up at UMass Amherst and have long, raucous conversations of all of us eating, drinking, and talking, and just you know throwing down. He was an extraordinary man. And uh, he, his spirit is still here. And so I was very much uh, uh, moved to create that piece about him for this exhibition so that he would be there in community with June Jordan. And of course, those two are there. And we surely, if we don't know it, can go back to the record of the video of Baldwin's discussion about the four little girls. So that room and the sound umbrella that's in that shrine room was created for me uh, by a wonderful young sister here, Didor, who is uh, just an extraordinary gifted poet, performance, uh, 
image maker, not performance artist. She's a performance image maker because that soundscape was created in a short amount of time through our coming together and having conversation and tea at my home and her uh, communication and communing with the ancestors. So you never really um, talked and, and met with uh, Baldwin when you were in uh, France? No, no. When I was the only, only, only person of any particular note like Jimmy that I met when I was in France was uh, uh, Ted Jones, the poet, jazz poet. Uh, crazy Ted Jones. <laughs> and when I say crazy, that's a love thing. You know, <laughs> it ain't about them being off up here. It's about them being really deep. So, uh, no, I didn't, I didn't meet him when I was there. Uh, I was just, what was I? I think I was 19 or 20 at the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm still only just a few years you know, older. Thank you. Anyone else? We have one. Well, we have one down here and then back here. Right here with the glitter. Yeah. Yeah. That looks like, okay. Here we go. And then we have one up in the back. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. So good to see both of you. I may be the only person here who was at Mass Art when you were there. <laughs> and so this is not a question. This is a, a statement of gratitude. From the time you came to us, you were always generous, upbeat, welcoming. Your home was a way station for <laughs> students that go back to the 70s. And yeah. now here we have Flo Linda who you know, find a second home working with you. And I just want to thank you because not every professor, not every academic has that spirit of generosity and the understanding that though in, in one way these are your gifts, they're not just yours. Yeah. They belong to the ancestors and they belong to the future. Yeah. And you have always had that, that open door. I think it was Howard Thurman that says, to love is to make of one's heart a swinging door. And you've done that for us. And then I also uh, like to share with people that you are the person who brought Juneteenth to Boston <laughs> long before, that's right, long before the institution started having events and all of that kind of stuff. We used to do Juneteenth at your house and you would bring your, your colleagues from Chicago. They would come up and we would eat and there would be drumming and there would be art. And, um, you know, in a place like Boston, our souls need, need to be fed. <laughs> you know, this is this city can be cold in many different ways, not just the yeah. weather. Uh, but you were always one of the people who brought the warmth, who brought the joy, who brought the connections and who always had time for conversation, for tea. And I just want to thank you for that because it benefits this entire city. Um, even though not everyone here has had that experience with you, it benefits the entire city to have someone like you in residence here. I just want to thank you for that. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Did we have someone in the back here, up top? Here. Right, all the way up, all the way up. Can you hear me? Blue yes. Mass, yes. yes. Good. Mr. Joan Tenderson, it is an honor to meet you. My pleasure. Yes, um, you as well. And what brought me here tonight is because um, somebody gave me a piece. And... Um, it is called Weeping and Wailing, and it was written in pencil. And I looked all over for it, um, did, tried to do my research and looked on the, um, on the website and looked through that. I looked everywhere. I couldn't find this piece. But, um, you know, I, I've gotten a great deal of education as a result of getting this piece. And the story behind it is a long story, but, <laughs> but I got this in my hand, and my first thought was, I could, I'm gonna see if I could get some paper for this piece. <laughs> see, let me see who made it, see if I can get some paper for it. But as I did, as I was doing my research, I claim ignorance. I didn't know who you were. I live in Boston. I see these, um, this artwork as I navigate around Boston all the time. And I didn't know, you know, who you were. Well. Nice. But, but I have this piece, and it's called Weeping and Wailing, and it was uh -huh. written in pencil in 1993, and yep. 
I wanted it's, to authenticate it. I, I, <laughs> I'm here you, to authenticate the piece. Did he you, really you, do this? You've already authenticated it by describing it. So <laughs> you, and, you and I can hook up a yeah. little bit later on that because I'd like to give you some, uh, as they say, the, a little bit more information on that. But just since you put it on the platform so far, it came out of a series I was working on, a series of six silk train prints. It was a suite of prints. And the We've Been in a Whaling piece is um, drawing upon the uh, uh, Kenti textile because it's in bands of patterns that go horizontally. And at the lower register are profile images of, uh, I think it's six or seven figures marching in a direction simultaneously. Yes, and it's, it it's, it's uh, reminiscent of ancient Egyptian what they call isosophilic arrangement of human forms. And they would be all in profile going in the same direction, mm -hmm. same foot, same everything. Mm -hmm. exactly. And there is a, the, desi the design of the eye has a pattern at the lower level, which is an exact replica of an uh, Egyptian hieroglyphic that represents weeping, crying. Mm -hmm. And it is the uh, relationship of going taking it from there and bringing it to New Orleans, going to the cemetery in that lamentation to bury the soul. And on its way back, the second line, because there's another print that is about the jubilation. So you've got the entry to the cemetery as the burial and the other, which you don't have. And I don't. <laughs> I have one. <laughs> uh, so they, now you have some information about that piece, and so. Uh, but wow. still, I'd like to meet up with you, and we can chat more later. Fascinating. Thank you. Okay, we have time for maybe one more question. <laughs> Hello, hi. I, I'm all the way back here. Um, I'm honored to be here again. Thank you for being so generous with your artistry and knowledge. My question has to do. Um, because your work has so much intricacies and meaning and messages and notions of history, do you often or do you at all hope that people who experience them know or can relate or do you leave it to interpretation? Um, some of all of that. But most importantly, the titles give you some they're like a footnote, a footnote for you to go further than the work. Uh, the narrative that's in the work is my uh, attempt to have the viewer have an experience with this work that takes them to, um, to a higher place and you can interpret higher in all those different manners in which one could do that than they were when they first came upon that work. I want them to leave having, uh, as I would say, uh, spiritually uplifted and aesthetically elevated because I see the work and I would like for people to be able to uh, have the kind of experience I have in the creation of the work and be able to visit the journey and the energies that have come through me and back out into the work because the works, those are, you see the portraits and the images of the people. Those people have come to me and I put them back out. And so I'm, I, there is room, and I've had the blessing of been, uh, meeting people in the general public as they, I've gone back and taken friends who've visited town or various other kinds of situations to some of these public pieces I have out there. And people have uh, made commentary about things that they see in the work which they bring it to my attention which I was not even aware it was there in the work because the work and I are just so close. But I have had the experience that your question is that many people have been able to find those things and other things that I'm not even aware of in the work that 
is really what I would love for them to do. And so I, I just see myself as an instrument by which there's a conversation that I'm continually having with all of those who uh, share with me their, their spirit, their energy, uh, that allows me to then interpret that and bring it back out into the kinds of works that I do. And so uh, it's just, uh, it's all of that. And thank you for asking that question. I would like to say thank you to the Institute of Contemporary Art for having the vision and the courage and the brilliance to have an exhibition on the work of Napoleon Jones Henderson. I thank the executive director, the board. I thank the curators and the entire staff. I am humbled to be a friend and a groupie to Napoleon Jones Henderson. <laughs> and I think at this time we owe him and the Institute a huge round of applause. Thank you, H.